Hello and welcome to the Book of Revelation Historicist View. This is part 15, Can I Get a Witness? And we are Lebanon Springs House. So grateful you've joined me today. Before I get started on today's video, I want to express my appreciation for all of you who have been patient waiting for this video to be produced. Life has a way of interrupting our best laid plans and several things have been going on in, in my sphere of the world not to mention some technical difficulties with some of my programming. But really, mostly, I have struggled with this video, and by that I mean chapter 11. I believe we have to do due diligence in studying these things, but it seems every time I open this book and, and try to affirm some things, new information surfaces, and I kind of have to adapt. Now, I'm not talking about new information as far as the Word of God, but history, or my understanding of the history, or... Um, other, you know, things that people maybe in this view has have said that I didn't see before. And, you know, so being flexible and, and never saying, thus saith the Lord, but giving a good answer for the research, um, I think is important. And so I expect to have to make adjustments and be flexible. Indeed, I think, um, you know, only the, the scripture is thus saith the Lord, and the rest of us are just kind of talking about what we think it means, and we must be very careful there. Really, having said all of that, ultimately we depend upon Yahweh to either verify or maybe even disqualify some portions of our understanding, and I for one concede right up front that my understanding of this book is not perfect. Um, that, that doesn't change the fact that I thoroughly believe that looking at this book through the lens of history to be spot on, there are simply too many evidences to suggest otherwise, in my opinion. Now, again, thank you, and I, I trust that you're going to watch today and take every thought captive to Christ. We're going to begin this video as we do all videos, and that's with a review of our last one. We saw the second interval in chapter 10 symbolized by the mighty angel with a book in his hand, and we also saw that that would bring about divine intervention that would have a worldwide purifying effect as the gospel once again circulated via that little book from Revelation 10, the Bible but that it would bring about persecution once more as well. This is a good place to remember that between the first and second intervals, a lot has been going on. Remember the first interval between the sixth and seventh seals brought about conversion of all of the 12 tribes of Israel, and that led to an innumerable multitude in heaven worshiping at the throne of God. That second interval, as we've just seen, brought about the Reformation. But in between these two intervals, we know that the reincarnated beast kingdom arose and had been thriving right alongside the last vestiges of the Roman Empire, Daniel's fourth beast. We saw the seal judgments weaken that empire, and then we saw the first four trumpet judgments bring down the Western Roman Empire by 476 AD, and the final three trumpet judgments took down the Byzantine Empire, also known as the Eastern Roman Empire, by 1453. Just two short years later, the second interval, we saw the Reformation being heralded, if you will. And today, we're going to discuss who the two witnesses best represent. But before we can even do that, we have to deal with a literary aspect of this book something I like to call parenthetical chapters. In short, the action stops or is paused while John is given insight into the characters or the players. In fact, today we meet the two witnesses, but in chapter 12 we see a woman and a dragon, and in chapter 13 we finally get to personally meet these two beasts of Revelation. Each of these chapters is important. As I said, John is given details about the players, but I think we also learn something pretty significant when we look at the placement of these chapters within the book of Revelation itself. For example, in chapter 10, we discovered the second interval that we have labeled the Reformation. 
And today we see the two witnesses and we'll come to see that the Reformation, that time period in history, is when these witnesses will be prophesying, actually just prior to that Reformation rising and continuing to witness afterwards. Next in chapter 12, we see the woman representing the people of God and her arch enemy, the dragon. It's as, a, as if these two worlds collide right in the middle of the book of Revelation because this chapter is sandwiched almost directly in the middle of this book. So that's going to be very interesting when we go forward from chapter 13. We meet the two beasts, as I said, but they are the characters, if you will, of the dark side. And the chapters that follow chapter 13 will describe that beast kingdom. It will talk about the judgments which befall that beast kingdom. And then we actually get to see what it looks like when it falls. So again, having these character or parenthetical chapters right in the middle of this book, it really divides our focus at, at the first half we're looking at the witnesses, looking at the people of God as they worship in heaven, as they um, pray, okay, as they see these things unfolding. And when we get to, by the time we get through the middle of this book, we begin to focus, our focus shifts to, again, this beast kingdom and the bowls of God's wrath, which will be directed at him and his kingdom. So that's just a cool um, literary feature I think that most of us don't get upon first inspection. These, these chapters are also connected or linked by several phrases that most of us are fairly familiar with. In chapter 11 we see the witnesses prophesying for 1,260 days while the Gentiles tread the holy city 42 months. The next chapter the woman flees to the wilderness for a period of 1,260 days and is nourished there for a time, times, and half a time. And finally, in chapter 13, the beast of the sea is given power to continue 42 months. It may not be easy upon first glance to see the connection with these phrases, but it's really easy to solve. So let's look at our phrases. We see 1,260 days, 42 months, and finally time, times and half a time. We want to convert all of these phrases to day, to days, because we have a formula to convert prophetic days to actual years via the principle of prophetic time that we've already used several times in this series. Again, um, we want to look for the actual period of time in history that we want to focus or zero in on. And so changing first all of these phrases to days so we can then convert them to years is where we want to begin. And since our first phrase, 1,260 days is already in that form, we'll just move it up here. Next, we see that 42 months has to be converted. But we have to remember with the principle of prophetic time, months consist of 30 days. So when you do that math, 42 times 30, well, that yields 1,260 days. The final phrase, while not as familiar, I think, to some people, most Bible scholars agree that the Greek word used for time notates an annual year or the rotation of the calendar, if you will. It's almost unanimously viewed as one year, two years, and half a year, yielding the very familiar three and one half years. And again, according to the principle of prophetic time, years consist of 360 days. So taking 360 times 3.5 or three and a half years, and you've probably guessed it by now, also yields 1,260 days. It's the contention of the historicist view, as well as my own, that these are the same 1,260 days. We're merely being told what different groups are doing during this time period. And with this as our backdrop, we are now ready to begin our study of the two witnesses of chapter 11. Revelation verse 1 reads, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. I believe it's helpful to take key words and look at them a little closer. 
We find that reed is kalamos in the Greek and it's interpreted as a reed or a pen. John is definitely going to be writing something down, recording it, and remember a recorded historical document is a legal document. Next we're told that the reed is like a rod, rabdos, a stick or wand, a rod, but it can also be translated as a scepter. This again lends an air of an, some official purpose here. And then the angel tells John to agiro, to waken, rouse from sleep, sitting, disease, or even death. And that's very interesting given the history behind this verse because it's almost as if the angel is saying, wake up, John. Finally, John is told to metreo, to measure by a fixed standard, a lot by rule. This is not guesstimation, but a very precise measuring that's going to take place. As we progress through today's video, we're going to find that verse 1 directly connects us with the second interval period of chapter 10. The chapter and verse um, distinctions put in there later by man can sometimes help or lose really the fluidity fluidity of the scriptures. This really, this verse connects us in a beautiful way that you really cannot see right here, but when we talk about the symbols behind and the history, it'll come clearer into our, our understanding that this is really a beautiful uh, encompassing of that entire period in chapter 10 we call the second interval. We'll also remember that I told you these parenthetical chapters, the action is suspended, but it's going to feel as if we're moving forward in time. Technically speaking, our timeline is frozen in the late 15th and early 16th centuries as the Reformation is getting underway. And again, when we get to the interpretation portion of today's video, I believe we'll, we'll see again that we're still in that interval period. This again, verse 1, connecting us to that because um, he's describing this, as we have talked about them before, this spiritual event that's happening. Okay, next I want to look at what John is actually told to measure. And the first item, of course, is the temple of God. I thought this would be a very good opportunity to consider for a moment the various temples not everyone is familiar with the differences, and since John is going to be measuring the temple, it might be interesting to consider how these various temples compared anyway. And Footprints of God, pilgrimages.com, tells us this green rectangle represents an American football field. Next, we see the Court of the Tabernacle. This is the tent which was erected and disassembled multiple times during the wilderness journey of 40 years. And we see Solomon's temple, which we understand to have been very grand. However, it is dwarfed by Herod's temple, the temple that existed, of course, when our Lord walked the streets of Jerusalem. Looking at Ezekiel's temple complex, it is vast, huge. And we remember Ezekiel, of course, as the prophet noted for the visions of the millennium. So this being the millennial temple, what a lot of people like to call the third temple today. What's really important here is to understand the fact that there was no temple standing when John received this revelation. It had been raised or burned to the ground in 70 AD by, as you remember, the Roman military commander Titus, or rather by his guards. We learn that from the book of Daniel. And Mr. Barnes, my favorite Bible commentator, in thinking that the temple is somehow representative of the body of believers, that's certainly a New Testament analogy, speaks to the possible symbolism here when he says there would be, therefore, a fulfillment of this if at the time here referred to there should be occasions from any cause to inquire what constituted the true church, if it was necessary to separate and distinguish it from all other bodies, and if there should be any such prevailing uncertainty as to make an accurate investigation necessary. Next, John is told to measure the altar. 
And again, Mr. Barnes shows the problem with taking this literally. To measure that literally would be to take its dimensions of length, breadth, and height. He says, but it is plain that it cannot be intended here, for there was no such altar where John was. And he says, if the reference were to the altar at Jerusalem, its dimensions were sufficiently known. Finally, on this issue of measuring things, John is told to measure the worshipers themselves. There is some apparent incongruity, says Mr. Barnes, in directing John to measure those who were engaged in worship. But the obvious meaning is that he was to take a correct estimate of their character, of what they professed, of the reality of their piety, of their lives, and of the general state of the church considered as professedly worshiping God. Now, in stark contrast to measuring all things spiritual, verse 2 seems rather inconsistent when John is told to leave out the temple outside, the court outside the temple, because it's given unto the Gentiles and they're going to tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. Matthew Henry, in his commentary on the whole Bible, suggests what is possibly meant by the court outside the temple. Some say that Herod, in the additions made to the temple, built an outer court and called it the court of the Gentiles. He says, some tell us that Adrian built the city and the outer court, calling it Elia, and he gave it to the Gentiles. Either way, says Mr. Henry, this was no part of the temple, according to the model either of Solomon or Zerubbabel, and therefore God would have no regard to it. And this is an illustration of what that possibly looked like. It was a rather large space. And again, Mr. Barnes tells us more about its possible purpose. There is undoubtedly reference here to the court of the Gentiles, as it was called among the Jews, the outer court of the temple to which the Gentiles had access and within which they were not permitted to go. He says to an observer, this would seem to be a part of the temple, and the persons there assembled would seem a portion of the true worshipers of God, but it was necessarily neither the one nor the other. Now this is also a good point to remember, as we have said before, that throughout all of history, Gentiles could join the Commonwealth of Israel. Anyone could. Remember, we had Egyptians leaving Egypt during the Exodus, and we had God-fearers all throughout that time, even throughout the New Testament, right up to Cornelius, the first Gentile admitted into the quote-unquote church. But at the time that this represents the when the temple was built, before Messiah's sacrifice, this was as close as the Gentiles could get to the temple or the worship of God. So, again, here Mr. Barnes is saying, in John's vision, this might look like part of the true temple and the true worship of God, but we know this is, was as far as the Gentiles could come. In fact, that's why the gospel is good news. With Messiah's sacrifice and his institution or confirmation and strengthening of that new covenant found in the book of Jeremiah, the Gentiles now flow into the commonwealth of Israel, right? Into the covenant with Yahweh through the new covenant in Messiah's blood. But before that, this was as close as they could come. We're going to find that it's pretty significant, I think, that neither Solomon's nor Zerubbabel's repaired temple had a court for the Gentiles. But John's vision does have one. Perhaps Yahweh is going to draw even a more definitive line in the sand. I want to look at the day for a year principle for just a moment. We've already mentioned the 42 months that these Gentiles are going to trample this holy city. And again, we've said those are 30 day months yielding 1,260 days. But if we plug that into our day for a year principle, of course, it's really 1,260 years that these Gentiles will be trampling the holy city. So now let's talk about the holy city. In fact, let's talk about a tale of two cities. In chapter 11, John speaks of both a holy city and a great city. And really, we just need to dis 
to, to decide if one city is being described by these two words. In other words, a holy city would be a great city, and a great city could be holy. Or is John really talking about two different cities? And the most uh, easily that comes to mind would be Rome and Jerusalem. Now, not surprisingly, there are varying interpretations even within the historicist camp. I happen to believe that these are two different cities being talked about, and they aren't as obvious as you might think at first glance. Mr. Barnes will hint at a not-so-obvious city here. He says there is no doubt that the words the holy city literally refer to Jerusalem, a city so called because it was the special place of the worship of God. He says, but it is not necessary to suppose that this is its meaning here. And that is in rare Mr. Barnes form, of course. So quickly recapping the symbols found in these first two verses, John is told to measure the temple, the altar, and even the worshipers. And whatever is meant by the holy city, we're told it's going to be trampled for 42 months. I think Mr. Barnes is hinting, and I would agree, that when we think of the holy city, we should think about where God is worshipped at this particular time in history. In verse 3 we read, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. The first thing I want to point out is that in the original Greek, the word power is not present. That has been added by the King James translators and borrowed by other versions as well. If we were to remove that word, it simply reads, and I will give my two witnesses. You may be thinking that doesn't change an awful lot and maybe not, but I'm always trying to get to the cleanest interpretation and sometimes that just means getting to the bare basics. However, I also happen to think that if we can remove the power, the word power, which isn't there in the original, it slightly changes our view of the two witnesses when we look later at how they are equipped to contend with their listeners. And I think that's going to be an important difference. We've certainly seen this word before, witness. It's martus. It's a witness and by analogy a martyr. We remember that Jesus, Yeshua, was the faithful witness and martyr, as were all of the martyrs of the fifth seal trump judge, judgment. We're going to find out that these witnesses, well, most of them, are also martyrs. Next, we consider the fact that most people are expecting exactly two witnesses, and Matthew Henry says it's a small number, but it's sufficient. He says, for in the mouth of two witnesses, every cause shall be established. Of course, he's quoting the Old Testament there, and I thoroughly agree with Mr. Henry's conclusion that two witnesses are sufficient to establish a matter. We are going to see, however, that the historicist view purports a considerably larger group of witnesses, as we shall see. As to what the witnesses will be doing, we're told they're going to prophesy. And that Greek word is prophetuo, to foretell events or to speak under inspiration. Now, most of us are familiar with the aspect of foretelling future events. I might even suggest we're too familiar with that idea. We might actually miss the function of these witnesses. Commentator John Gill, in his commentary on the whole Bible, says whatever this means. The sense is that Christ will give them a mission and commission, sufficient authority, all needful gifts and grace, courage and presence of mind. And certainly these witnesses needed that. Verse 3 also shows the witnesses clothed in sackcloth, and that is fairly straightforward. Sackcloth. It is a sack made out of mohair, very sturdy but fabric, and I imagine quite uncomfortable. But the Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown commentary says this is the garment of prophets, especially when calling people to mortification of their sins and to repentance. And Mr. Barnes adds, here it's an emblem of mourning. And the idea is that they would prophesy in the midst of grief. The next two symbols are found in verse 4. These are the two olive trees and 
and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Now first let's understand what these are. By this he means the two witnesses. Yes, the two witnesses are two olive trees and two candlesticks. This is usually what we envision when we read this verse, and it's probably as correct as anything. But what most of us miss is that there is another very similar, if not almost identical, vision in the body of Scripture. Zechariah in chapter 4 explains his vision. And the angel said unto me, What do you see, Zechariah? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof, and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. The context here is that Zerubbabel is about to return and repair the temple. They've been in exile, and Yahweh wants Zechariah to tell Zerubbabel that this is not going to be done by man's strength, but by God's strength, by his spirit. And most of us are familiar with the idea of oil symbolizing the spirit of God in the Old Testament. He wants us to know it's going to be ample and sufficient for the need. So first off, we, we ask what has changed between Zechariah's vision and John's? And the answer is John sees two candlesticks. Overall, these verses paint the picture of two very somber witnesses, when often we see them as larger than life and ready to rumble. However, I believe this to be a more accurate view. Revelation 11.5 reads, And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. The first thing we notice is that the phrase, if any man will hurt them, is repeated. I believe that's for volume. We're definitely being told there are those who will hurt them. But we often also focus on the harm these witnesses can do to others by breathing fire from their mouths. Now we could be thinking of James and John, the sons of thunder. Remember, they asked Jesus if they could call down fire from heaven to devour the Samaritan villagers because they wouldn't receive Jesus and he had to consequently continue on to Jerusalem. But remember his response, you don't know what spirit you're of. By the way, this John is our John of the book of Revelation. I just wonder if he marveled over the fact that these two witnesses would, would be able to use fire against their listeners when he wasn't given permission to do so. You have to admit that's an interesting thought. Next, we learn that they have the power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and they have power over waters to turn them into blood and to smite the earth with all kinds of plagues as often as they want to. From verse 6, we learn that these two witnesses, besides having the ability to devour their enemies with some kind of fire, they, well, they also have power over the sky, the earth, and the water. And that should sound fairly familiar. Remember that mighty angel? There can be little doubt as to the source of their power. Moving on to verses 7 through 10 and beginning with verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Before we get focused on the heart of this matter, I wanted to just talk about this war that this beast will wage against the witnesses. I think that it exposes the fact that he fears them. He sees them as unfriendly and he's just flat out afraid of them. I mean, isn't that why we're usually attacked? Because we're feared. Now, I also want to mention this is the first mention of the word beast in the book of Revelation, even though you and I have talked about the beasts for some time now. And it can be a little confusing because this beast comes out of the bottomless pit, whereas the beasts from chapter 13 come out of the earth 
and the sea. The first thing we should remember is that this is a very deeply literary book. I mean, at the very least, Yeshua affords himself a lot of license when introducing these symbols. But just a cursory reflection here, and we realize that the pit, the inner earth, and the sea each symbolize a lower realm, and they all speak of a dark origin. So hopefully that will clear up any real confusion. Next, verse 8 tells us that their dead bodies lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Let's notice that John doesn't use the word holy city here, but great city. And in our minds, those two words might be linked, but very quickly we understand that this isn't the meaning here, the usual great. I think of the two words famous and infamous. They're both known for, or meaning well-known. One is well-known for good things, where the other is well-known for evil things. I think it could be said of this great city that it's infamous. But Mr. Barnes is going to hint that it, it could have something to do with its size. He says, as a great city would be the agent in putting them to death, so the result would be as if they were publicly exposed in its streets. He says the word great here supposes that the city referred to would be distinguished for maybe its size, a circumstance of some importance in determining the place referred to. Well, as I said, um, it's not really obvious at first, but hopefully by the time we finish this video today, these two cities will be pretty much, pretty much etched in our minds forever. But we have to ask, can we really know what city John is talking about? Which city John is talking about? And, you know, we've talked about Rome, We've talked about Jerusalem, but now John adds Sodom and Egypt. I mean, what is one to think? Sodom, of course, doesn't even exist any longer, and though Egypt is a uh, frequent topic in the Bible, it certainly is not in the book of Revelation except for the passage before us. So what is Yeshua telling us? Because John has used the word spiritual here, it is spiritually called Sodom and spiritually called Egypt. I think we have to think spiritually and I'm going to suggest that instead of thinking of Rome or Jerusalem when we hear about the great city or the holy city, we need to think of the spiritual cities Babylon and New Jerusalem, right? Babylon being the spiritual city where the kingdom of darkness reigns and likewise New Jerusalem being the spiritual city, the city of God coming down out of heaven at the end of this book, at the very least. So I think if we think of these spiritual cities, we will better understand the and make sense of the symbolism in this chapter. Next, verse 9 tells us, And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not allow their dead bodies to be put into the graves. If this is a literal event, it would be grave indeed. And yes, I meant that pun. Forgive me. But I have to ask, considering the state of the world around us today, would that really phase us? I mean... The fact that the risen Lord appeared to John to warn us or prepare us for what was to come, would leaving two dead bodies in the streets even faze us today? I don't mean to be cynical, but I just don't believe it's going to be that simple. The level of depravity that humanity has reached in the 21st century would probably scoff at the thought of this being something we needed to be prepared for. If, however, we search the field of revelation for that priceless gem and dig into the symbolic meaning we're actually astounded by the exacting detail of events foretold 2,000 years before they occurred. I'll say it again, if you want proof God exists, open your Bibles and read, but particularly read the book of Revelation. To have such exact details 
Details that only a god could know ahead of time play out the way they did. Well, that's miracle enough for me. That's proof enough that God exists. And remember, Jesus wanted us to read, hear, and guard this book in particular for a blessing. While verse 10 seems almost inconsequential, John tells us that the earth rejoices once the prophets are dead. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. While that's not wholly surprising that they would rejoice once the prophets were gone, but again, when you look at the historical facts behind the prophecy, it was played out pretty incredibly how this beast saw their supposed victory and how they responded really a thing of beauty and we have to ask how is it that these prophets tormented them first off notice that they're not called witnesses here they're called prophets and that's because it's through their prophecy that the torment comes in order to really understand this, I think we have to tweak our understanding of the word prophecy because today I would suggest we have a skewed understanding of this phenomenon. And ChristianAnswers.net in their article, What is a Prophet?, helps us begin this conversation. They tell us biblical prophets are persons who convey a message from God or teach the Word of God. He is the mouth by which God speaks to men and hence what the prophet says is not of man but of God. They say the whole word of God may in this general sense be spoken of as prophetic inasmuch as it was written by men who received the revelation they communicated from God. But they go on to say the foretelling of future events was not a necessary but only an incidental part of the prophetic office. They say the great task assigned to the prophets whom God raised up among the people was to correct moral and religious abuses to proclaim the great moral and religious truths which are connected with the character of God and which lie at the foundation of his government. Because today's video is already going to be rather lengthy, I'm going to forego giving this subject the attention it really deserves and only briefly reiterate what I said early on in this series, that the Balaams amongst our congregations have sold us a bill of lies when it comes to having a word for us from God. How do I know this? Because a word from God would be, by definition, from the Word of God. And you don't have to be a scholar or a world traveler to detect a counterfeit. Matthew Henry is going to double down on this idea when he tells us these witnesses who by their doctrine and example had teased, terrified, and tormented the consciences of their enemies. He says these spiritual weapons cut wicked men to the heart and fill them with the greatest rage and malice against the faithful. So you see, it's just as Yeshua said, they hate these witnesses because they hate Jesus. They hate the word of God. And that's exactly what Jesus was, the living word of God, walking out the word of God so we would know what it would look like. Adam Clark then tells us that it actually became a custom of public rejoicing. They sent gifts to each other and gave portions to the poor. But Mr. Eliot in his Horai Apocalypticae is going to hint at maybe another reason they publicly rejoiced, that they made it almost an official response. He says it was not to be put out of sight. Every means was adopted of preserving the recognition of the fact that the witnesses were dead by mutual congratulations, by the making merry and interchange of gifts. I think he's su suggesting a deeper meaning behind their rejoicing, not just their exultation were they publicizing, but maybe a deliberate warning. And I would have to agree. By making this the official response, it was kind of a reminder to adopt the correct view of these things or we will make an example of you too. Without a doubt, the record does show that a war was waged against the people of God during this period in history. And one of the results of that war was indeed dead bodies, countless numbers of them. However, the bigger picture 
is going to be the campaign against the witnesses, which I, I believe continues to this day. It's in the next several verses that we read the account of the resurrection. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven, saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Well, this is going to have to be the understatement of the century, if that literally occurred. But we should not underestimate the response from the beast kingdom of a symbolic fulfillment of this verse, because needless to say, the scriptures say it rocked this beast. Also, come up hither. We have to remember this was the exact phrase that John heard when he was invited to see the future. And we discussed at length then how it didn't fulfill the scriptural requirements of the rapture. We also looked at all of those resurrections. But clearly John is seeing the two witnesses ascend to heaven. And naturally we ask, is this another resurrection? In verse 13 we read, And the same hour there was a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. So verse 13 telling us about another earthquake, which we love because those give us markers to pinpoint exactly where we are in history. And Mr. Barnes reminds us that an earthquake is a symbol of commotion, agitation, change, of great political revolutions. He says the meaning here is that the triumph of the witnesses, represented by their ascending to heaven, would be followed by such revolutions as would be properly symbolized by an earthquake. He says that that is the tenth part of that which is represented by the city, the persecuting power. A city would be the seat and center of the power and the acts of persecution would seem to proceed from it. He continues, The word tenth is probably used in a general sense to denote that a considerable portion of the persecuting power would be thus involved in ruin. That is, that in respect to that power, there would be such a revolution, such a convulsion or commotion, such a loss, that it would be proper to represent it by an earthquake. Recapping then the symbols in these verses, we see that the witnesses are raised to their feet and ascend into heaven. But now let's quickly talk about the three and a half days that they actually laid in the street of the great city. If this is a literal interpretation, that makes sense, right? Because we're going to be able to view their, their bodies for three and a half days before decomposition really sets in. However, if this is a symbolic interpretation, that's going to be a little more problematic because we have to apply the day for a year or year for a day principle, and we're really looking at these bodies for three and a half years. And that's just not possible, short of eating frankincense or frankenfoods that we have today. I mean, their bodies are going to decompose much sooner. So we have to really look for a a sense or explanation of how their bodies can be viewed for that length of time. John finally records, quote, the second woe is past and behold, the third woe comes quickly. Now he's already told us about these woe trumpets and we'll remember that the first woe was the fifth trumpet of Islam, the second woe, the sixth trumpet of the Ottoman Turks. And right now, as I said, we're currently between the sixth and seventh trumpet between the second and third woe in the second interval period. So the next woe that is coming is surely the seventh trumpet. And we remember that it will contain the entire next set of judgments. Well, we have finally arrived at the interpretation portion of today's video. And according to the historicist view, the history of the two witnesses from circa 800 AD and onward were fulfilled by believers 
who were martyred prior to and after the Reformation. They both testified to the truth of the gospel and they testified against the errors and corruption of the papal church. Now, again, I'm going to remind you that these interval periods have lingering effects. And the first thing we have to realize about this chapter on the two witnesses, essentially we are still between the sixth and seventh trumpets. That seventh trumpet has not yet sounded. So as John takes this opportunity to describe the first set of characters, the action is paused and our time clock is frozen. But nothing could be further from the truth than the fact that the Reformation continued to grow, evolve, if you will, and have moments of renewal. In fact, I think today we're kind of experiencing another phase of that Reformation. I often think about Lazarus when Jesus raised him from the dead. There was a moment when he was so far gone. I mean, we chuckle at the thought of his sister even saying, but Lord, he stinketh. Now we know that was the reason Jesus waited four days, right? He wanted to prove his power over life and death. But after Lazarus came out of the sepulcher, Jesus made another announcement. Loosen the grave clothes from him. In other words, he was no longer dead, but he wasn't quite living. He wasn't the walking dead, but not quite free either. So even though the Reformation clearly broke with the papacy deception, it continued practicing many of the decrees that the papacy instituted by its own quote-unquote authority. And the Protestant church today continues in most of those practices. Now, I've alluded to this before, but I believe we're currently in the third interval, which is the place the next huge spiritual earthquake is revealed. I think that's what we've been seeing all around us for these last few years. These are revelation size events. And in the last century alone, we've seen the rise of many false religions and many more false prophets, even within the Protestant vein. But we've also seen the return to the ancient paths as the Bible recalls or refers to them. And we're commissioned to seek those ancient paths because that's where truth and wisdom lie. So yes, in this last century, We've also seen a return to God's word. We've seen a return to celebrating Yah's holy feasts, and we've even seen a declination of man-made traditions and holidays. It seems very much to me that we're almost in another phase of the Reformation. It's like the Lord is finally removing our grave clothes, the ones that we've been stumbling around in since the Reformation, still kind of bound up in some of the baggage that we brought with us from that time. But we've really moved beyond celebrating the great escape from that beast kingdom. And we're again, finally walking in the spirit, moving and having our being in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in the God of the Bible. So now that we've seen the definition of these witnesses according to the historicist view, I want to suggest maybe another way to frame these two groups of people. It's the same way that the book of Revelation has framed them all along, those who keep the commandments of God and those who have the testimony of Jesus Christ. I've said all along that this is Christ's audience, this is whom he is speaking to, and these are those who are coming out of Babylon. Now going directly to verses 1 and 2, remember the symbols found there, John was instructed to do a lot of surveying. And as Christine Miller from the Revelation of Jesus Christ revealed, who shares the long-held view of this symbol, this picture of measuring the temple, the altar, and those who worship there has traditionally been understood to be the thorough examination of the newly available scripture, the little book of Revelation 10, to define biblical faith. The Protestants examined almost every doctrine of the Roman Church, holding it up to the scrutiny of that little book in their attempt to reestablish biblical, scriptural worship. So now we just ask, what is the significance of measuring the three components, the temple, the altar, and the worshipers? To which Mr. Barnes replies, it is to be assumed that Revelation chapter 11 verses 1 and 2 refers to the necessity at the time of the Reformation of ascertaining what was the true church, 
of reviving the scripture doctrine respecting the atonement and justification and of drawing correct lines as to membership in the church. As to measuring the temple itself, he adds, this we have seen was a direction to take an estimate of what constituted the true church. He says the very work which it was necessary to do in the Reformation, for this was the first point which was to be settled, whether the papacy was the true church or was the Antichrist. This probably sounds very foreign to many of us today, but I assure you, the reformers were completely serious in questioning the legitimacy of the papacy. We're going to cover the details again closer in chapter 13, but the Pope's claims to be the vicar of Christ on earth, that is to say a substitute Christ, that's the meaning of Antichrist. It doesn't mean I'm against Christ, or it doesn't mean only I'm against Christ, but in place of Christ, instead of Christ. And their claims to be Christ on earth were serious infractions to say the least. As to measuring the altar, he tells us this would relate to the prevailing opinions on the subject of sacrifice and atonement, on the true method of a sinner's acceptance with God, and consequently on the whole subject of justification. The papacy had exalted the Lord's Supper into a real sacrifice. They made it a grand and essential point that the bread and wine were changed into the real body and blood of the Lord, and that a real offering of that sacrifice was made every time that ordinance was celebrated. It, the papacy, had changed the office of the ministers of the New Testament from preachers to that of priests. It had become familiar with the terms altar and sacrifice and priesthood as founded on the notion that a real sacrifice was made in the Mass. The doctrine of justification by the merits of the great sacrifice made by the death of our Lord had been superseded by the doctrine of justification by good works and by the merits of the saints. To change the fundamental understanding of how one is saved is the quintessential definition of heresy. And by leading people to good works or to the merits of dead saints was to lead them away from the cross of Jesus Christ as the only means of salvation. This is heresy. It only highlights the irony that it's going to be the Roman Catholic Church putting to death so-called heretics whose only sin, according to that church, was to stand on the word of God. As to measuring the worshipers, Mr. Barnes tells us, for ages, the doctrine of baptismal regeneration had been the established doctrine of the church. Now, however, all that was necessary was baptism and confirmation. He says the necessity of regeneration by the influences of the Holy Spirit as condition of church membership was little understood, if not almost wholly unknown. The grand requisition in papal membership was not holy living, but the observance of the rites and ceremonies of the church. One of the first things necessary in the Reformation was to restore the doctrine laid down by the Savior that a change of heart and regeneration by the Holy Spirit was necessary to membership in the church. Mr. Barnes says, that's how true worshipers were renewed in the spirit of their mind. He says to take an estimate of those who worshiped in the temple of God, that is, to settle the question who should be regarded as true worshipers of God and what should be required of those who professed to be such worshipers. No more important point was settled in the Reformation than this. That the Roman Catholic Church merely required baptism to place your name on a church membership role and then furthering that idea through equating church membership with salvation. Well, that was nothing short of what Constantine had done, which was casting a huge net and relegating everyone inside it as Christian, whether or not they were. I want to look at this term canon. It's from a Hebrew Greek word meaning cain or measuring rod and it was passed into Christian usage we're told to mean the norm or rule of faith. 
the church fathers of the fourth century first employed it in reference to the definitive authoritative nature of the body of sacred scripture. So now we see the significance of all this surveying John is doing with a reed or a cane, a measuring rod. It's going to be the very Bible, the word of God itself, that they are being measured against. Next, turning to the very interesting instruction not to measure the cord outside the temple, but to leave it out, We've discussed that this was a court probably built by Herod and designated for the Gentiles. We've also seen that it was not a part of the wilderness tabernacle, nor a part of Solomon's grand temple. And it's been suggested that that's why it was left out, because Yahweh would have no regard for it in the first place. But here, in the context of measuring everything else and overlaid upon the backdrop of the Reformation, I think it's perhaps one of the most powerful and clear instructions given to John, that is to say, to the reformers by Jesus. How is that? Well, again, look at the Greek word used, number 1544, ekbalo, and it's been translated as leave out. Its real definition is to eject, to cast out, to drive out or send away. John, or rather the reformers, aren't to just skip over this court of the Gentiles. They are to discard it altogether. And Mr. Barnes tells us the one was to be measured or estimated, the other was to be left out as not pertaining to that or as belonging to the Gentiles, he says, or to paganism. He says the idea would be that though it professedly pertained to the true church and to the worship of God, yet that it deserved to be characterized as paganism. He says, can anyone doubt the truth of this representation as applicable to the papacy? Almost everything that was unique in the ancient pagan systems of religion had been introduced into the Roman communion. He says a stranger at Rome would see more that would lead him to feel that he was in a pagan land than he would that he was in a land where the pure doctrines of Christianity prevailed and where the worship was celebrated, which the Redeemer had designed to set up on earth. So far as pure religion was concerned, so far as pertained to the real condition of the church and the pure worship of God, he says it would be as if the whole holy city where God was worshipped were given into the hands of the Gentiles, and they should tread it down and desecrate all that was sacred for the time here referred to. This is a precise picture of what was happening in history. The counterfeit church, and again, by that I mean the counterfeit religion, being foisted upon believers by the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, trampled underfoot the doctrines of the truth faith, and it trampled the true saints, desperately trying to hold on to the faith once delivered to the saints. Again, when we think of Holy City, we should be thinking of New Jerusalem, because that's who they're trampling. That's us. And Mr. Barnes is going to aptly resonate this point when he says, Everything in Rome at the time of the Reformation would sustain this description. He's actually going to quote Martin Luther now. It is incredible, says Luther on his visit to Rome, what sins and atrocities are committed in Rome. They must be seen and heard to be believed. So that it's usual to say, quote, if there be a hell, Rome is built above it. It is an abyss from which all sins proceed. So again, he says, It is commonly observed that he who goes to Rome for the first time goes to seek a knave there. The second time he finds him, and the third time he brings him away with him under his cloak. But now, says Luther, people are become so clever that they make the three journeys in one. It was the opinion of Luther and the other reformers that Rome in their day was tantamount to Las Vegas in our time. What happens in Rome stays in Rome. But it wasn't just Luther and hardcore reformers who had this perspective of Rome. Next, we'll see that Mr. Barnes quotes Machiavelli, the noted Italian diplomat, author, philosopher, historian, who lived during the Renaissance. So Machiavelli, one of the most profound geniuses in Italy, and himself a Roman Catholic said, the greatest symptom of the approaching ruin of Christianity is that 
The nearer we approach the capital of Christendom, the less do we find of the Christian spirit of the people. The scandalous example and crimes of the court of Rome have caused Italy to lose every principle of piety and every religious sentiment. He says, we Italians are principally indebted to the church and to the priests for having become impious and profane. Could it be any clearer that even if you believed the Pope had the authority that he espoused, that he was the vicar of Christ on earth? Well, the fruit of that authority was rotten. Nothing would better describe the condition of Rome previous to and at the time of the Reformation, says Mr. Barnes, and the remark may be applied to subsequent periods also, than to say that it was a city which once seemed to be a Christian city and was not improperly regarded as the center of the Christian world and the seat of the church, and that it had been, as it were, overrun and trodden down by pagan rites and customs and ceremonies, so that to a stranger looking on it, it would seem to be in the possession of the Gentiles or the pagans. Wow. The early reformers, the early Bible commentators, they left no doubt what they thought of the pagan practices and abominations of Rome, of the Roman Catholic Church. It's just that we've lost this history, so we've lost this perspective. Next, Christine Miller is going to tell us exactly who she thinks the holy city is. She says, I believe it is New Jerusalem or Zion, not the physical city of Jerusalem, but that spiritual place where the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ have their citizenship. And then she cites Ephesians and Philippians for support there. Now, the 42 months that the Gentiles trample the holy city will be expounded upon in chapter 13, which covers the beast. Now, in verse 3, remember we learned they were, the witnesses would prophesy for a period of 1,260 days. And Mr. Eliot of Horai Apocalypticae tells us the commencing time of their 1,260 days, testifying in sackcloth, coinciding as they evidently do with the 42 months of the apostasy and treading underfoot of the holy city, he says must be dated from the rise or establishment of that dominant system of error vis-a-vis -vis, about the close of the 6th or the opening of the 7th century. So he's, of course, hinting at when that beast kingdom first arose. And of course, we will cover that in depth in another video. But this is also where we learn about the two witnesses identifying, if I can use that word, as two olive trees and two candlesticks. Now, besides the fact that this is really the second appearance of this vision in the body of scripture, remember Zechariah had the first one, Christine Miller tells us that Paul in the New Testament clarifies the olive trees. He says, the two olive trees are the wild and cultivated olive trees, the wild olive tree being Gentile believers and the cultivated olive tree being Jewish believers. Now, I think we should look at Romans 11 a little closer because this is really important what Paul is telling us here. He says, for if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? Now, he's not really asking a question, making a very passionate statement. Remember. Paul um, speaking here to the Gentiles, he, he goes on in that chapter to say, don't get above your raising. Because again, if Yahweh took out the natural branches because of unbelief or disobedience, he can take you out as well. And again, moreover, he can add them back in once they believe in Messiah. So this is important information about the two olive trees. And this term that Paul is using is a very technical term, and it's meant to describe really the relationship between these two groups of people. And there's no getting around it. Paul makes this really clear. He's talking about the Jews and the Gentiles. 
That is who the two olive trees represent. And again, this grafted in term that he tells us that the Gentiles have been grafted in, being a technical term really should convey the message that the Gentiles do not stand on their own. We don't stand on our own. We haven't replaced Israel. We have been placed into or grafted into the Commonwealth of Israel. And right now, we usually think of the Jews when we think of Israel, but hopefully by now we've learned that's two of the tribes. So, moving on to the next symbol, the two candlesticks. And again, we've looked at this in terms of what uh, Zechariah, his vision, and we're going to look a, a little closer at that maybe in a minute. But first off, we have to remember that Jesus himself in the first book or first chapter of this book explained the symbolism of a candlestick. He told John that the seven candlesticks um, are the seven churches, okay? And again, they're always before the throne of God. In other words, they're, they're, the churches are always represented before the throne of God. It's a very beautiful picture as we saw early on. But if what Yeshua, Jesus, tells us having the meaning of the body of believers, well, it just seems to me that the Old Testament saints at the time of Zechariah's vision certainly would have been his candlestick, right? It would have been the only body that existed at that time who represented the God of the Bible. And now we like to say the church as if it's some different or separate entity. And again, hopefully by now we're getting the idea that really there's one body or one bride of Messiah and that would be the Old Testament saints as well as the New Testament saints. And again, we're going to look at Zechariah chapter 4. Let's go there now. He says, Then I answered the angel and said unto him, Well, what are the two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side of? And the angel answers him and says, Don't you know what these are, Zechariah? And he says, No, my lord. And then the angel tells Zechariah, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. So, clearly, Paul tells us the olive trees are the Jews and the Gentiles. In Zechariah, we see the two olive trees always before the Lord, and they're the anointed ones. And now we're told in Revelation that they're the two witnesses. You know, this isn't rocket science. It's pretty pretty clear that the two witnesses who have always existed in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, um, these are both the candlesticks and the olive trees, which clearly are the people of God. Okay, well, there's one other thing I just want to, again, hone in the fact that here Zechariah says, well, these two olive trees flank a single candlestick. And again, at the time that Zechariah lived and prophesied, only the people of Israel, all 12 tribes, existed. Um, they were in the, you know, the two different kingdoms, if you will. They had been split by a civil war. But they all existed, and that's all that existed um, alongside of any... God fearers that joined the Commonwealth of Israel. So in John's vision, we see two candlesticks. And I still think that this book, this entire book, is making the case that Christ's audience are the Old Testament saints, the New Testament saints. These candlesticks and these olive trees, clearly, again, Paul, you can't misunderstand him. You really can't. Now, the Bible also has other texts that support the identity of the two witnesses. And next, Christine Miller from the Revelation of Jesus Christ is going to suggest that they appear throughout Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, she says, as we will see. And then she cites the two lampstands and the two olive trees as defined in Zechariah chapter 4, which we've looked at extensively, as the two sons of new oil who stand before the God of the whole earth 
The language of the prophecy, she says, is exact because we are meant to connect these two passages by common theme. You know, if she's correct that these two witnesses have indeed appeared throughout the scriptures, we probably could make a list of them. And she's going to begin with two witnesses for Yahweh in the book of Numbers, chapters 13 and 14, as being Caleb of Judah and Joshua of Ephraim. She says they are two witnesses because they agreed with God's word to Israel about the promised land, while the other ten encouraged the children of Israel to reject God's word. So those are certainly a good beginning for our lists, Caleb and Joshua. Next, she reminds us that the nation of Israel was divided into the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom, Ephraim, or sometimes just Israel. Interestingly enough, she says, when the house of David went to make war against the northern kingdom, as soon as they had their civil war and split, in order to restore all 12 tribes under the kingship of David once again, Yahweh told the king through a prophet Shemaiah that the division was of him and to cease and desist. So really what she's telling us is that we could add these two kingdoms, albeit split from a civil war, but Judah and now Ephraim or Israel become two witnesses because still in their own way they each continued to testify to the God of the Bible. Next, she tells us that the prophets furthermore prophesied to these two houses of Israel, Judah and Ephraim, about their restoration and their reunification in the last days under one king who is the returned Messiah. And you can find that in the books of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. We've studied this extensively as well in this series. Remember, Jesus came to seek the lost sheep of the house of Israel. We saw that in Matthew chapter 15, and those were his own words when the Samaritan woman approached him. From his own, the house of Judah, that would be Yehudim, that's where we get our word Jews, he chose fishermen. And they would fish for the northern lost ten tribes, that would be Israel, from the Sea of Galilee. And that means the multitude of Gentiles. And why did he do this? In order to confirm or strengthen that new covenant found in Jeremiah chapter 31. I can't stress this enough. If you haven't seen the videos on the 144,000 on who Israel really is, it's going to be pretty difficult to follow this book of Revelation. This is history that you really can't circumvent if we're going to understand what we're being told here. Really, the fact that those ten lost tribes dispersed into all of the world, never to return to the land, living, as we've seen, like Gentiles, worshiping pagan gods in those lands, losing their identity. They are the Gentiles coming into the covenant through Messiah. Why? Because the Jews, the Yehudim, are preaching the gospel of Messiah. Now that's just history. Again, it, you cannot change it. It's what it is. But we can understand it better than we have. So we get to add now the Jews and the Christians, or the, those Gentiles, coming into the covenant. And yes, they've brought many with them. Many have joined Jews. And that's another whole prophecy um, of the, the two sticks, right? Judah and his friends and Ephraim and their friends. And so Jews and Christians, again, two groups of people who have always uh, testified to who God is and to his Messiah. Christine now is going to double down on this assertion by using the parable of the prodigal son. It's really beautiful. She says, in the parable of two sons, the younger goes away to the Gentiles. Hmm and squanders his father's inheritance with lawless living. He ends up in the pig pen. She says the younger son then corresponds to Ephraim of the Gentiles or the Christians. The elder remains in his father's house and does the will or law of his father. She says the elder son then corresponds to Judah or the Jews. 
But one day the younger comes to his senses and returns to his father. She says the end result is both brothers unified together in one house under the headship of the father. Now that's just a beautiful picture and we know this as Christians. We know this parable of the prodigal son, but have we ever seen it through these eyes, through this lens, through history, in the sense that you know, this is a beautiful picture of the two groups of people who, again, always testify to the Messiah and the God of the Bible. You have these Christians living lawlessly, not having to keep the law, and that really deserves its own video. Yeah, I just need a couple more hours in each day. But what a picture of, of those coming in who, who are just coming in under the blood of Messiah, grateful through grace, and then we have the Jews, who also, throughout all time, was under grace. That's not a new thing. Grace has been here all along, and I'd love to talk about some Hebrew paleo pictures of what, what it means to be saved through grace. Again, another time. But these two groups of people, there's just another way to frame it. Those who keep the commandments of God, and those who have the testimony of Yeshua. So get that history, go back and look at those videos, look at them again, but particularly if you haven't seen them, it's, it's too important, I think, to just skim over. Well, Christine is gonna offer one final addition to our list of witnesses, and that's going to be the two who appear with Jesus when he is transfigured, and they are, of course, Moses and Elijah. She says at first glance, it seems that the analogy breaks down. Moses was from the tribe of Levi, even though Elijah was from the northern kingdom of Ephraim. But she says, does it? Moses represents the law of God, his teaching, his ways, his paths of righteousness. He represents the letter of the law. He then corresponds to Judah or the Jews. Elijah represents the Spirit of God, the power of God, that which infuses the letter with life. Elijah is known for miraculous signs, something we consider the sphere of the Holy Spirit. And as prophet to the Northern Kingdom, the House of Israel, he then corresponds to the Gentiles or the Christians. So again, adding Moses and Elijah to our list, we can clearly see that these two groups of people have undoubtedly been witnesses for the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob throughout all, if not most, of history. Now, there's certainly no denying Moses and Elijah's connection with these groups of people. We just saw that. You know, but even the futurist proponents of this book believe that maybe Moses and Elijah will be the two witnesses. And again, I think when you step back and look at a bigger picture, there's nothing so far that we've seen that just, you know, detracts from this idea of these two groups, the body of Messiah, the Old Testament saints and the New Testament saints being the witnesses for God. There's finally one other idea floating out there. It's less popular, but I thought we might as well throw it in here because it really does, again, big picture, fit. And that would be the two testaments of the Bible. The 39 books of the Old Testament, the 27 books of the New Testament, of course, totaling our 66 books of the Bible. People believe that these are two witnesses that have always testified to God and to his Messiah. And of course, that is true. But I would assert they still represent Israel, the Old Testament saints, and what we call the church, the New Testament saints of Messiah. So earlier on, I I just... I told you that we would probably be able to look at the specific identities of the witnesses in this time period who not only prophesied but were persecuted. And I believe we can know because of history and recorded history. But remember, they're going to belong to one of these groups of people, those who keep the commandments of God or those who have the testimony of Yeshua. And we're going to delve deeper into their identities in just a bit.
Next, in verses 5 and 6, we learned that the witnesses can breathe fire upon their enemies, to which Mr. Barnes suggests. The meaning here is that they would have the power of destroying their enemies as if fire should proceed out of their mouth. That is, their words would be like burning coals or flames. Now, before you are too deflated, you know, the scriptures actually support what Mr. Barnes is saying here. In Jeremiah chapter 5, Yahweh tells Jeremiah that he's going to bring punishment upon the people of Jerusalem, the men of Judah in particular, just like he did with the kingdom of Israel. But because the men of Judah have been falsely prophesying, let's look at that. Therefore, thus says Yahweh, the God of hosts, because you have spoken this word, and by that, that would be the false prophesying the men of Judah are speaking. Behold, I am making my words in your mouth, Jeremiah, a fire, and this people would, and the fire shall consume them. No one believes that Jeremiah spewed fire from his mouth actually and burnt up the bodies of the people in Jerusalem. We understand that these words that Jeremiah prophesies over Jerusalem regarding the nation that Yahweh is going to bring to punish Judah, they're going to come true, and in this way the people will be destroyed and the prophecy will be fulfilled. Just a little bit later in chapter 23, again, the Lord says, Is not my word like a fire, declares Yahweh, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? And next we saw the power they, these witnesses have to shut the sky so that no rain will fall during their days of prophesying. Mr. Barnes is going to help us understand this. He says it may be used to denote merely that they would be clothed with the power of causing blessings to be withheld from people as if rain were withheld. That is, that in consequence of the calamities that would be brought upon them and the persecutions which they would endure, God would bring judgments upon people as if they were clothed with this power. He says the language, therefore, it seems to me, does not necessarily imply that they would have the power of working miracles. Now, I told you earlier that if we removed the word power, which isn't in the original Greek in that verse earlier, um, we would have to look at them a little differently. And I really believe this is at the heart of the difference between say the futurist view and the historicist view of this book. Believing that miracles and supernatural powers are going to be the fulfillment of this book, that's the crux of the matter. I'm not saying that we shouldn't believe in miracles. We could debate all day long, as many have and, and still do, whether or not the gifts or miraculous powers given to the disciples in the early church still exist today. And none of us could definitively answer that question, but hopefully most of us could give a good reason for why we believe what we do. I think the biggest problem that I see with expecting these prophecies to be supernaturally fulfilled in the sense of an otherworldly fashion is that at the same time these events are occurring, whether they're all in the past or all in the future, the Antichrist is supposed to be equipped with the ability to produce miraculous signs. Now let's clarify that they're gonna be false, but they're gonna be miraculous in the same sense. So, I mean, they're gonna be so convincing, we're told, that they might deceive the elect if that were possible. I love the fact that rather than leave us vulnerable to whose signs belong to whom, the fact that these are really being fulfilled historically, it almost circumvents the possibility of being wrong on that point. And I understand a case can be made just like in Egypt, where Pharaoh's magicians could produce a certain level of miraculous signs, and Moses is, of course, being authentic, it was easy to, easy to tell the difference. And when we get to chapter 13, and we look at the lying signs and wonders that this beast did perform, they should be pretty obvious as well, okay? They have nothing at all in common with the miracles performed by the Messiah and the disciples in the early first century, and yet untold millions have been duped by them.
and I believe are still being duped by them. You know, the book of Revelation mirrors so much of the scriptures. Remember in 1 Kings, we saw Elijah the Tishbite from Gilead telling King Ahab, As Yahweh the God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Now, that really happened. That was a literal event. And not only that, but it didn't rain for three and a half years. Again, we're, we're supposed to connect these passages. Elijah had the ability by his words to stave off all rain for three and one half years. And I don't think that's, again, a coincidence. That was a literal event. But remember, the Bible tells us first comes the physical and then the spiritual. And now we're dealing in the symbolic realm of revelation. So we need to look for how this would be a spiritual event rather than a literal event if we're going to keep in line with the historicist view. And again, it's Mr. Barnes who helps us with the spiritual application of this symbol. So Moses says in Deuteronomy, My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. So says the psalmist, he shall come down like rain upon the mown grass, as showers that water the earth. And so says the prophet, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, so shall my word be. The meaning here then, says Mr. Barnes, must be that spiritual influences would seem to be under their control, or that they would be imparted at their bidding and withheld at their will. He says this found an ample fulfillment in the history of the church in those dark periods, in the fact that it was in connection with these witnesses and in answer to their prayers that the influences of the Holy Spirit were imparted to the world and that the true religion was kept up on the earth. Next, Mr. Barnes is going to quote an author from a work entitled The Seventh Vial. We'll actually be looking at that work a little more directly. But he tells us, It is an historical fact, says the author of The Seventh Vial, that during the ages of their ministry, there was neither dew nor rain of a spiritual kind upon the earth, but at the word of the witnesses. There was no knowledge of salvation, but by their preaching. No dissent of the Spirit, but in answer to their prayers. And, he says, as the witnesses were shut out from Christendom generally, a universal famine ensued. Now, the author, James Aiken Wiley, seems to me to be suggesting what I can only view as an obvious consequence of so little truth on the earth at this time period. He expounds further in his The Seventh Vial, The Past and Present of papal Europe as shown in the apocalypse. The word of God was locked up in a dead language or forbidden to be read. The priests of Rome, instead of preaching the gospel, descanted on the merits of indulgences, the efficacy of relics, or entertained their hearers with monkish traditions or ridiculous and mendacious legends, things he said that could not feed the soul. The heavens were shut and there was no rain. Pining away under their sore thirst, men sought to the fountains of life, but only to find that they were dry. Can we not see the beauty of the symbolic fulfillment of shutting the heavens except by the witness's power of speaking the word of God? Power to direct the spiritual influences upon mankind simply by prophesying the word of God. The church so-called was not prophesying the word of God. Hence, it was not blessing the people of God. But what of their power over the waters to turn them into blood? Exodus chapter 7 tells us Moses could do it. Moses and Aaron did as Yahweh commanded. In the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, he lifted up the staff and struck the water in the Nile, and all the water in the Nile turned into blood. Again, that was a literal event. And James Wiley in his seventh vial speaks of this power the witnesses seem to have. We are told at a subsequent part of the apocalypse that 
waters are the symbol of peoples. And when we're told that these symbolical waters should be turned into blood, we learn that the nations in question were to be wasted by direful carnage and bloody wars. The Egyptians, he said, had attempted to destroy the Hebrews by drowning their children in the Nile, and righteously was the Nile turned into blood. The anti-Christian nations would employ the sword to exterminate the witnesses, and by the sword should God exterminate them. Hence, the song of the angel of the waters when the third vial was poured out upon the rivers and fountains of water. Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shall be, because thou hast judged thusly, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Because the beast persecuted the witnesses, their words of prophecy will accomplish the fulfillment. For you see, the seventh trumpet angel is about to introduce the seven bowl judgments. You know, it's been a while since I have given you a spoiler alert, so here it is. The first four bowls, just like all the first four judgments in any series, are linked. And they're going to be fulfilled by the Napoleonic Wars which ravage Europe and bring the Beast Kingdom to its knees. Okay, that makes sense. But next we're told that these witnesses have the power to strike the earth with every kind of plague. Now, given the fact that we've survived the 21st century plague of COVID, I certainly hope we have survived it, it's tempting for believers to conjure up images of disease and vermin to fulfill this part of the prophecy. And indeed, those types of trials have plagued mankind throughout all history, and obviously they still do. However, we have to look to the history to find the impression that was laid upon John's eyes. And again, Mr. Wiley tells us, what mean the bloody wars and the calamities of divers kinds which have ravaged the popish countries of Europe these 300 years? What especially mean the terrible wars of the present century which have covered the papal earth with conflagration and slaughter? He says, these are the words of the men who dwelt amid the Alps. Words uttered long ago, remembered in heaven, though forgotten on earth, and now awfully verified. This is the answer to their prayers. This, he says, is the fire from the mouth of the witnesses, kindled, burning, and to burn yet more fiercely. So we are being told that the two witnesses have the power to strike the earth with every kind of plague. But hopefully by now we can begin to see that their prophesying is going to be fulfilled by the next set of judgments. So the details of those plagues are in the first four bowls. And those details aren't given until chapter 16. Remember, we have a few parenthetical chapters before we get there. So you're gonna to have to trust me on this that we will be able to see the different plagues that strike the earth because of their prophesying. Right here, we're only told that they do so. We're not told how they do so, as Mr. Wiley next suggests. It was especially during the latter half of the period of their prophesying that these judgments were to be inflicted, and particularly after the seventh angel had sounded and her last plagues had begun to fall on Rome. All these plagues will come in answer to the prayers, in fulfillment of the predictions, and in recompense of the wrongs of the witnesses. The words we have been considering look back on three theaters of judgment, Jerusalem, Egypt, Sodom, and they exhibit the three leading plagues by which Rome's destruction shall be accomplished, famine, blood, and fire. God has raised up mighty prophets to warn her, says Mr. Wiley. He has spoken to her by Luther, by Calvin, and by all the reformers, but Rome refused to hear. He has visited her with fearful judgments, but Rome refused to be humbled. You know, it's a loving God who warns, and God has always warned his people, and he has warned Rome. I would have to agree with Mr. Wiley that today, Rome still refuses to be humbled. She still refuses to acknowledge the God of the Bible. I mean, that would have to be the case if she refuses to acknowledge 
the Word of God as being supreme. It's in the next four verses that we learn that the beast is going to make war on the witnesses, conquer and kill them, that their dead bodies will lie in the street unburied for three and a half days, and that the earth will rejoice over them even to the point of exchanging gifts. Now that's a lot to cover, so let's get busy. We're going to begin with verse 7. And Mr. Barnes tells us that this war was commenced in the Edicts of Councils, which stigmatized the pure doctrines of the Bibles and branded those who held them as heretics. The next step was to pronounce the most dreadful anathemas on those who were regarded as heretics. He says which were executed in the same remorseless and exterminating manner in which they were conceived. The confessors of the truth were denied both their natural and their civil rights. They were forbidden all participation in dignities and offices. Their goods were confiscated. Their houses were to be razed and never more to be rebuilt, and their lands were given to those who were able to seize them. In short, they were shut out from the solace of human converse. No one might give them shelter while living or Christian burial when dead. He says at length even a crusade was proclaimed against them. Preachers were sent abroad through Europe to sound the trumpet of vengeance and to assemble the nations. The Pope wrote to all Christian princes, exhorting them to earn their pardon and win heaven by bearing the cross against heretics rather than by marching against the Saracens or Moslems. And Mr. Barnes says the fact is that during this long period of error, corruption, and sin, there were those who were faithful witnesses for the truth, people who opposed the prevailing errors, who maintained the great doctrines of the Christian faith, and who were ready to lay down their lives in defense of the truth. I mentioned earlier that we would be talking more specifically about the who, who the witnesses were during this time period, because I believe through recorded history, we can know. And Mr. Barnes tells us that E.B. Eliot actually divided the witnesses into three specific groups. The earlier Western witnesses embracing such men and their followers as Serenus, Bishop of Marseille, the Anglo-Saxon Church in England, Agobard, Archbishop of Lyon from 810 to 841 AD. These were on the one side of the Alps. And Claude of Turin on the other, Gordish Claucus, 884 AD, Beringer, Arnold of Brescia, Peter de Bui, and his disciple Henry. And then there were the Waldenses. The second group, known as the Eastern or Paulician line of witnesses, a sect deriving their origin about 653 AD from an Armenian by the name of Constantine, who received from a deacon by whom he was hospitably entertained a present of two volumes, very rare, one containing the Gospels and the other the Epistles of Paul, and who applied himself to the formation of a new sect or church. In token of the nature of their profession, they adopted the name by which they were ever after distinguished, Paulikiani or Paulicians, or simply the disciples of the disciple Paul. Mr. Eliot tells us this sect continued to bear testimony in the East from the time of its rise until the 11th or 12th centuries when it commenced a migration to the West. And finally, we see the third group of witnesses. Witnesses during the 11th and 12th centuries up to the time of Peter Waldo. Among these are to be noticed those who were arraigned for heresy before the councils of Orléans, Arras, Toulouse, Oxford, and Lombert in the years 1022, 1025, 1119, 1160, and 1165, respectively, and who were condemned by those councils for their departure from the doctrines held by the papacy. Mr. Barnes says, for a full illustration of the doctrines held by those who were thus condemned, and of the fact that they were witnesses for the truth, you can see the longer work of Eliot. Now I must say it does seem rather audacious to be able to group the witnesses so definitively as Mr. Eliot seems to have done. And 
Next, Mr. Wiley is going to speak to the difficulty of such a task when he tells us, there's not one of the 10 horns which has not at one period or another of its history persecuted the saints. Nor is there a spot in Europe within the limits we have formerly traced which has not been sprinkled with their blood. We need only name the murderous crusades carried on for ages against the Waldenses and the Albigenses, the slaughter of the Piedmontese, whose bones whitened the Alps, the martyrs of Provence, whose blood tinged so oft the blue waters of the Rhone, the massacre of St. Bartholomew in August 1572, which continued three days and in which, in Paris alone, 30,000 Protestants and throughout the departments of France, 40,000 more perished. These are historical facts, and although it would be a difficult task indeed to name all of the martyrs, it would be impossible, just like the martyrs of the fifth seal judgment. We could look at some of those people, we could look at certainly the leaders, and it gives us an idea of those who were living, those who were martyred for their faith. It's, it's enough to know that there were real people, real prof prophesying witnesses who spoke out not only for the word of God, but against corruption. Indeed, Mr. Barnes dares to remark about the sum total of the persecuted when he says it has been computed that since the rise of the papacy, not fewer than 50 million of persons have been put to death on account of religion. Of this vast number, the greater part have been cut off during the last 600 years, for the papacy persecuted very little during the first half of its existence. He says it was in this way that it was not until the witnesses had completed their testimony or had borne full and ample testimony that it made war against them. In a little bit, I'm going to make a distinction between this war or campaign that the beast wages against the witnesses and the actual history of persecution. I believe that history far extends past the scope intended by the campaign against the witnesses. In other words, the symbolic interpretation is not to be overshadowed and lost by the literal fact of the actual persecution. And I hope this will become clearer. And it's going to be helpful again to look at some words a little closer, words that maybe you would have thought we didn't need a definition. We're told the beast makes war. And that can simply be any activity undertaken by a political unit, such as a nation, to weaken or destroy another. Now I bring this up because this is not going to look like conventional warfare, like we saw in the sixth trumpet where the Ottoman Turks used cannon and gunpowder against Constantinople. The emphasis here is on any activity that weakens your opponent. Next, we're told he's going to overcome them, and usually we think about getting the better of, to gain the superiority, to win. But it doesn't follow that they have to be eradicated altogether. Remember, to be the winner, you just have to paint your opponent as the loser. And finally, yes, we're told he will kill them. And again, that can be put to death outright, as indeed many witnesses are put to death. But it can also be, according to Strong's, figuratively to destroy. And again, we've, we've seen that as simply becoming the winner. And again, I, I'll just repeat it because it, it's the clearest. You know, make them the loser. Destroy their campaign. This beast, the Roman papacy, wanted to shut these witnesses up. He wanted them to stop prophesying. And really, he just had to silence them. He nearly accomplished his goal. And that brings us to their dead bodies lying in the street for three and a half days. Let's not forget that we've at least considered the possibility that this simply reflects that the witnesses have been silenced for a period of time.
Mr. Barnes tells us that is, there will be some signal victory in which those represented by the two witnesses will be subdued. And an effect would be produced as if they were put to death. They would be silenced. They would be apparently dead. We also spoke earlier about the tale of two cities. We spoke about a great city and a holy city. Only now we get to use the new clues that John has given us because he tells us the great city is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. I think you're going to find it interesting to see the reformers' thoughts on this point, and we will begin with E.B. Eliot's comments. This great city, he says, is clearly the same which is afterwards called Babylon, the city which then reigned over the kings of the earth, i.e. the Roman ecclesiastical empire, comprehending its ten kingdoms, subordinate to its sway. Right now we should be thinking about ten toes, those kings who are given a kingdom but give their power unto the beast. And we'll talk more about those in just a bit. He says the very terms Egypt and Sodom had often been applied to it by the Romanists themselves, as well as by the early witnesses and later reformers. The former name Egypt on account of its sorceries, darkness, and oppression of God's people. The latter, Sodom, because of its moral impurity and abominations, and I dare say we need to speak little about that today. He says, but the name which this great city assumed for itself was that which properly had belonged to New Jerusalem, the holy city, in marked contrast with which it is introduced in the Revelation. The resemblance, however, only holds good to apostate Jerusalem, he says, in that it is the scene in which their Lord, in other words, the witnesses' Lord, has been continually crucified afresh. Let's hold on to two things from Mr. Elliot's remarks here. First, what, if any, connection there is between Babylon, Rome, and New Jerusalem, other than they claim to be the holy city of God, the church so-called the beast kingdom, claiming to be New Jerusalem. And yet we're clearly seeing they trampled New Jerusalem, the people of God. Secondly, how is it that it can be said that the witnesses' Lord, their Lord, was crucified in Babylon? Well, we're going to develop that idea by beginning with continually crucifying the Lord afresh. And it's Mr. Gill from his commentary on the whole Bible that begins this. And he's really going to throw out several ideas that have uh, resonated throughout the years, and I think the, the further he goes, the closer he gets to the real idea behind this. But let's begin with his comment, For Christ was crucified actually in Judea, which was then become a Roman province, and under Pontius Pilate a Roman governor, and by his order. He says Christ suffered a Roman kind of death, crucifixion, and for a crime he was charged with, though a false one, against Caesar the Roman Emperor. I think Mr. Gill is suggesting that because Israel was not an autonomous nation, but a Roman province with a Roman governor, it's in this way that it could be said, even though Christ was crucified in Jerusalem, it could also be said that he was crucified in this great city, Rome, or again, spiritual Babylon. That's plausible. I see his thinking, but again, I think he gets closer as he continues. And Christ has been crucified at Rome itself, in his members, who have suffered persecution and death, and even the death of the cross there. Here clearly I hear Christ saying, Whatever you do unto the least of these, you have done unto me. And because believers, true members of the New Jerusalem, suffered persecution by Rome in Babylon, even the death of a cross, it's in this way that we could say, Christ was crucified in this great city. Next, he offers, he has been crucified afresh both by the sins and immoralities of those who have bore the Christian name there. And again, this is a New Testament warning that is repeated often. Be careful. If you profess to be a follower of Messiah, a Christian, but the fruit of your life is anything but the fruit of the Spirit, 
there's sin and immorality and abominations. You have nothing left to offer. You've trampled the grace of Christ. You have crucified afresh the Lord because of your sins and your profession to be a Christ follower. Well, clearly here in Babylon, in Rome, the so-called church professing to be the new Jerusalem, yet full of abominations, drunk with the blood of the saints and the prophets. This is how it could be said Christ was crucified through their sins and immoralities. But as I said, his last option here, I believe not only to be the most interesting, but probably the one most correct. And by the frequent sacrifices of him in the mass, Many of us being Protestants, we perhaps don't understand to what degree this Catholic teaching boasts, so we need to begin with a definition. And Gregory A. Smith from PewResearch.org tells us that transubstantiation, the idea that during Mass the bread and wine used for communion become the body and blood of Jesus Christ, is central to the Catholic faith. Indeed, he says the Catholic Church teaches that the Eucharist is the source and summit of the Christian life. Now for just a little balance, not that I feel terribly obligated, this Catholic website, northwesterncatholic.org, in an article by Cal Christensen, How Can I Explain Transubstantiation, tells us that it's a scholastic term that attempts to explain how bread and wine can become the body and the blood of the Lord without losing their exterior appearance. He says while the word was first used in the 11th century by Hildebert of Lavarden, the Archbishop of Tours, it wasn't until the Council of Trent, 1545 to 1563, that it became authoritative church teaching. Now clearly what this Catholic website is also telling us is that it wasn't authoritative church teaching for centuries, even a millennial after the, the early church and the disciples of Christ. They go on to tell us that the Council of Trent declared, quote, because Christ our Redeemer said that it was truly his body that he was offering under the species of bread, it has always been the conviction of the Church of God. And this holy council now declares again that by the consecration of the bread and wine, there takes place a change of the whole substance of the bread into the substance of the body of Christ our Lord and of the whole substance of the wine into the substance of his blood. Mr. Christensen says, this change the Holy Catholic Church has fittingly and properly called transubstantiation. I think we're going to be able to challenge their assertion that the conviction of the Church of God has always been that the body and blood of Christ is what is being offered. Christianity.com, Why Early Christians Were Despised, tells us of a document written in the late 2nd century AD called the Octavius of Minutius Felix, describing a debate between a Christian and a pagan at the Roman port of Ostia. It provides, they say, valuable insight into not only how Christians were reviled, but also how they responded. Notice that the charge leveled against Christianity is cannibalism, and Cecilius the Pagan begins the debate. Quote, you Christians are the worst breed ever to affect the world. You deserve every punishment you can get. Nobody likes you. It would be better if you and your Jesus had never been born. We hear that you are all cannibals. You eat the flesh of your children in your sacred meetings. Next, Octavius the Christian responds, quote, That story is probably based on reports that we share together a meal of the body and blood of Christ. That we do. However, he says, It is not the human flesh that we eat. It is the bread and wine we consecrate to commemorate our Lord's death. This second century conversation clearly leveling the charge of cannibalism against Christianity. 
is emphatically answered with, we do not eat human flesh. And yet we just saw that by the time of the Council of Trent in the mid-1500s, the Roman Catholic Church was indeed teaching that the bread and wine become the body and blood of Messiah. In fact, they said the church, the early church always believed this. This document, a legal document, seems to suggest otherwise. And this is problematic, very problematic. Moving on to the symbolism of the silencing of the witnesses for three and a half days, Mr. Elliot brings us to that threshold. Marvelously does this history of the period bear out the symbolic statements of the apocalyptic vision. Such a gathering of the deputies of people and kindreds and tongues and nations were met together in the city of Rome upon occasion of the Lateran Council, held from AD 12, 1512 to 1517, under the pontificates of Julius II and Leo X. One of its principal objects was the total extirpation of heresies, and upon the last named Pope's accession, no time was lost in proceeding against the only heretics supposed to still be surviving, the Bohemian Hussites, or the followers of John Huss. By a papal bull, these were summoned to appear before the council at its next session, and the 5th of May, 1514, was fixed for that important event. Thus, says Mr. Elliot, was the crisis come, which was to try the faith of this little remnant of witnesses and exhibit either its vitality or its death. And would they, he asks, then face their Lord's enemies? Would they brave the terrors of death and plead his cause, like many of their noble predecessors, before the legate and the anti-Christian council? Alas, no. The day arrived, the council met, but no officer announced the arrival of deputies from Bohemia to plead before it. Not a whisper was heard from any quarter in support of the long-continued heresies. No witness appeared. The orator of the session ascended the pulpit and amidst the applause of the assembly uttered that memorable exclamation of triumph never heard before or since. There is an end of resistance to papal rule and religion. There is none to oppose. And again, the whole body of Christendom is now subjected to its head, i.e. to thee, Pope. Alas, there was but too much cause of triumph. The witnesses were silent. They were as good as dead. From this day forward, for three and a half years, i.e. prophetical days, were the maintainers of the truth of Christ to be as dead corpse in the face of apostate Christendom. He says, let the day be remembered. It was May the 5th, 1514. I would like you to put that, de that date in your short-term memory for just a moment because it's going to become very important briefly. As I said before, I like to provide at least two witnesses when I can, but nailing down those supposed words of triumph has proven difficult. However, I was able to find in the written record of the Fifth Lateran Council documentation proving that the Bohemians were summoned before this council and a date was indeed set for them to defend or to denounce their heretical beliefs. Let's read a little bit from those excerpts. These are the minutes from the church councils given, uh, I'm assuming, by the Catholic Church in this papalencyclicals.net website. Let's notice first that the Fifth Lateran Council was held from 1512 to 1517 AD, and it was a series of sessions, and session 8 being held on the 19th of December, 1513. And we'll also notice that part of the topic would be about bringing back the Bohemians who reject the faith. In addition, since very great offense is given to God from the prolonged and manifold heresy of the Bohemians, and scandal is caused to the Christian people, the charge of bringing back these people to the light and harmony of the true faith has been wholly entrusted by us for the immediate future to our dear son, Thomas of Etzertgum, cardinal priest of the title of St. Martin in the Hills, as legate of ourself, 
and the Apostolic See to Hungary and Bohemia. We exhort these people in the Lord not to neglect to dispatch some of their spokesmen with an adequate mandate either to us and the Sacred Lateran Council or to the same Thomas Cardinal, Cardinal Legate who will be nearer to them. The purpose will be to ch exchange views with regard to an appropriate remedy by which they may recognize the errors to which they have long been in the thrall and may be led back with God's guidance to the true practice of religion and into the bosom of Holy Mother Church. With the approval of the Sacred Council by the tenor of the present letter, we grant and bestow on them by the faith of a pontiff a public guarantee and a free safe conduct as to their coming, going, remaining for as long as the negotiation of the aforesaid matter shall last, and afterwards for departing and returning to their own territories, and we shall consent to their wishes so far as we can under God. So that this sacred Lateran Council may be brought to the completion of the fruitful benefit desired since Many other serious subjects remain to be discussed and debated for the praise of God and the triumph of his church. We declare, with the approval of the Sacred Council, that the ninth session of the continuing celebration of the Sacred Lateran Council shall be held on the 5th of April, 1514, in the very first year of our pontificate, which will be Wednesday after Passion Sunday. And it concludes with, let nobody therefore yada yada yada, if anyone, however, etc., etc., and I suppose that's just how they ended their minutes. First thing I want to point out, if this is a counsel to hear the matter, why does it seem to have already been judged? Is that just how they did things? And secondly, I want you to remember that I asked you to burn in your short-term memory the date of May the 5th, 1514. Here we see April the 5th of 1514. And that difference of just about 30 days is going to become very important. It's actually going to make or break this part of the interpretation for this portion of the symbol. White Horse Media, H. Groton Guinness in his Romanism and the Reformation tells us at last, however, as the 15th century drew to a close, the furious crusade seemed about to accomplish its object. The beast had all but conquered and killed the witnesses, according to the prediction. The strong figure, employed by the witnesses lying dead for three and a half days, means, of course, that their testimony was silenced. They no longer prophesied. They were silent, helpless, extinct for a brief period. They were worn out. The wild beasts from the abyss had prevailed against them. For the moment, the struggle was over. This is a very clear representation by the symbols of the history at this point during the Reformation. Mr. Guinness continues. The fulfillment of this part of the vision was at the opening of the 16th century, just before the Reformation movement commenced. Next, he wants us to hear Mosheim's description of the crisis when he said, quote, as the 16th century opened, no danger seemed to threaten the Roman pontiffs. The agitations excited in former centuries by the Waldenses, Albigenses, Begards, and others, and afterwards by the Bohemians, had been suppressed and extinguished by council and by sword. The surviving remnant of Waldenses hardly lived. They were pent up in the narrow limits of Piedmontese valleys, and those of the Bohemians, through their weakness and ignorance, could attempt nothing, and thus were an object of contempt rather than fear. And next we see the detail of the earth rejoicing over the death of the witnesses, making merry and sending gifts one to another. And it's Mr. Wiley again from his seventh vial telling us that the news of this terrible slaughter was received at Rome with the ringing of bells and the firing of cannon, while the Medal of Gregory commemorates it to this day as a deed of illustrious virtue. Now, confessedly, I'm not sure which terrible slaughter 
Mr. Wiley is referencing here. It could have been any of those that we spoke of earlier, but what is clear is how Rome reacted to the news with merrymaking and rejoicing. Mr. Guinness says their enemies gloried in the fact. The Lateran Council congratulated itself that Christendom was no longer afflicted by heresies, and as one of its orators said addressing Leo X, John Nemo reclamat, nulla subsistit. There is an end of resistance to the papal rule, and religious opposers exist no more. And again, the whole body of Christendom is now seen to be subjected to its head, i.e. to thee. Leo commanded a great jubilation and granted a plenary indulgence in honor of the event. According to Dean Waddington, who describes the close of this council, quote, the pillars of Rome's strength were visible and palpable, and she surveyed them with exultation from her golden palaces. The assembled prelates separated with complacency and confidence and with mutual congratulations on the peace, unity, and purity of the apostolic church. The witnesses were dead. Never before, and certainly never since, was Rome able to congratulate herself that heresy was extinguished and heretics exterminated from the face of Christendom. He says it's a fine, striking hieroglyph of the crisis that the prophecy represents. There stands the fierce wild beast monster from the abyss. He has prevailed against his defenseless human victims. The struggle has been long and hard. It has made him all the more savage and impatient, but it is over at last. His jowls still drip with gore. His eyes are red with blood as he stands glaring with his fierce eyes on the pale, cold, silent corpses of Christ's two witnesses, so long empowered from above to resist and defy all his might. These are certainly powerful impressions from history, but they're ones that are easily envisioned. And if there's anything unbelievable about the book of Revelation, it would be that it so strikingly resembles those impressions from history. In verses 11 and 12, we see the witnesses rising to their feet and being called up to, he to heaven. But let's not forget that they have been testifying in front of councils, popes, and even kings, just exactly as John was told he would have to once again prophesy before peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. They have been ridiculed, scolded, demonized, excommunicated from the church, shunned in society, and many of them have been murdered. And yes, I believe that is the correct word. But they have stood their ground and faithfully witnessed to the truth of God's word and to the truth of his Christ. Now that's the one that's coming again, not the substitute Christ in Rome. And remembering where we are in time, the witnesses had been silenced, their cause seemingly defeated, and we're told that they remain in this condition for three and a half days. That being years, of course, in the usual treatment of time in this book. But what happens next in history is fairly amazing. Mr. Guinness says, note the sequel. In 1517, the Reformation began. The movement, which he says, like a snowball growing ever greater as it rolls along, has in the year 1887 100 and tiny millions of adherents, all professing the faith of Christ in opposition to the apostasy of Rome. Witnessing churches, Protestant churches, spring up everywhere and have been multiplying ever since. He says the 16th century presents the spectacle of a stormy sunrise after a dismal night. Europe awoke from the long sleep of superstition. Nations shook off their chains. The dead arose. Now, Mr. Gill is going to remind us that this is a symbolic resurrection. He says it's not to be understood of a corporal resurrection, for there is no reason to believe that there will be a resurrection of any particular saints 
until the general resurrection. He says it's going to be a civil resurrection of the witnesses, a resurrection of them as witnesses, when their spirits will revive and they will take heart and courage again to appear for Christ. He says the sense is that the Spirit of God will inspire these witnesses with fresh life and rigor, zeal and resolution, so that though they have been so long silent and lifeless and dispirited, they shall now rise in high spirits and bravely exert themselves in the cause of Christ. This is beautiful in the symbolic meaning. It's very clear what John is painting, the picture he is painting for us. Mr. Guinness puts it this way. The witnesses to truth who had been silenced and slain stood up once more and renewed their testimony. The martyred confessors reappeared in the reformers. There was a cleansing in the spiritual sanctuary. Civil and religious liberty were inaugurated. Now again, we saw that the prophesying against the papal corruption began as early as the 6th century. So we're not talking about a real resurrection. But the reformers, once they started speaking out after this period of silence, it was as if those martyred confessors stood up again in the reformers. And again, that's just beautiful. It's finally time to deal with the three and a half years. If it can be shown in some historical fact that the silencing of the witnesses, this period of time when it's as if they were dead, ended, and their voices ring out once more, as if they had been resurrected, well, it would fairly satisfy all that is necessary in this symbol. And it's Mr. Elliot, by way of Mr. Barnes again, who makes the case for us. He says, but it was with remarkable accuracy that a period of three years and a half occurred from the time when this proclamation was made and it was supposed that these witnesses were dead to the time when the voice of living witnesses for the truth was heard again, as if those witnesses that had been silenced had come to life again. He says, and not in the compass of the whole ecclesiastical history of Christendom, Except in the case of the death and resurrection of Christ himself, is there any such example of the sudden, mighty, and triumphant resuscitation of his church from a state of deep depression, as was just after the separation of the Lateran Council, exhibited in the protesting voice of Luther and the glorious Reformation? We need to find a period in time from the silencing of those witnesses to their resurrection. And Mr. Barnes tells us that all accounts agree in placing the beginning of the Reformation in 1517 AD. He says the effect of this, as compared with the supposed suppression of heresy or the death of the witnesses, and as an illustration of the passage before us, will be seen from the following language of a writer in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Quote, everything was quiet every heretic exterminated, and the whole Christian world supinely acquiescing in the enormous absurdities inculcated in the Roman Catholic Church, when in 1517 the empire of superstition received its first attack from Luther. Now remember, this is a writer with an encyclopedia who's not necessarily aiming at making the history line up with the scriptures. Next, we find that Mr. Barnes will quote another historian, a Mr. Cunningham, and we've actually seen his work before. He says, or in the language of Mr. Cunningham, quote, at the commencement of the 16th century, Europe reposed in the deep sleep of spiritual death under the iron yoke of the papacy. There was none that moved the wing or opened the mouth or peeped. When suddenly, in one of the universities of Germany, the voice of an obscure monk was heard, the sound of which rapidly filled Saxony, Germany, and Europe itself, shaking the very foundations of the papal power and arousing people from the lethargy of ages. Remember John, or the angel telling John, Agiro, John, wake up, wake up, you 
slumbering saints. The remarkable coincidence in regard to time, supposing that three years and a half are intended, will be seen, says Mr. Barn, from the following statement. The day of the ninth session of the Lateran Council, when the proclamation above referred to was made, was, as we have seen, May the 5th, 1514. The day of Luther's posting up his thesis at the door of a Wittenberg church, the well-known epic of the beginning of the Reformation, was October the 31st, 1517, so that the whole interval is precisely to a day, three and a half years. Well, that's fairly amazing, as I said before. But I have to note here, I asked you to put into your short-term memory the date of May the 5th, 1514, as we just saw. But we saw in the minutes of the session eight from the Lateran, Fifth Lateran Council, that they had first notated that date as April the 5th, 1514. And that's the difference of 30 days. And I told you earlier that this would make or break this as the interpretation of this portion of the symbol. Why? Because it took May the 5th, 1514, to October the 31st, 1517, to be precisely three and a half years. So again, whether or not the April the 5th was merely a typo, or whether or not that session was actually postponed for an entire month, either way, it's pretty amazing that the second date, or the date of May the 5th, 1514, is the date needed for this to precisely fulfill this portion of the symbol. Amazing. Now, what I want us to imagine for just a moment, if we can, the turmoil of that period prior to the Reformation. I imagine many good men and women within the Catholic Church over those centuries grieving over what they saw taking place. The persecution, the pressure to conform, the all-out prosecution against voices of dissent. Yet their hands were tied, or so they thought. I imagine they did what many of us do today, averted their eyes and prayed it would all somehow miraculously go away. And then imagine the fateful moment of that announcement that the struggle is over. There are no more opponents to papal rule. They must surely have felt at least some relief that the bloodbath was also over for the most part. How easy it is to forget all the horrors because you're just so thankful it's finally come to an end. Just to wake up one morning and to realize you were wrong. It's not only not over, but the fight is on like never before. We just have to come to this view of the book of Revelation to appreciate this historical view or we might as well close its pages forever. And Mr. Barnes is going to finish out this portion of the symbolism by telling us, all that is here represented would be fulfilled by a triumph of the truth under the testimony of the witnesses, or by its becoming gloriously established in view of the nations of the earth, as if the witnesses ascended publicly and were received to the presence of God in heaven. All this, he says, was fulfilled in the various influences that served to establish and confirm the Reformation and to introduce the great principles of religious freedom, giving to that work ultimate triumph and showing that it had the favor of God. All this, he says, is manifestly mere symbol. The sense of the whole is that these witnesses, after bearing a faithful testimony against prevailing errors and sins, would be persecuted and silenced. That for a considerable period, their voice of faithful testimony would be hushed as if they were dead. That there would be general exultation and joy that they were thus silenced. 
that during that period, they would be treated with contempt and scorn as if their unburied bodies should be exposed to the public gaze. And that they would again revive as if the dead were restored to life and to bear a faithful testimony to the truth again and that they would have the divine attestation in their favor as if they were raised up visibly and publicly to heaven. We have arrived at the final verses of our study today. It's been a long one, I know, but there's still so much to consider. I hope you can hang in here with me. In these next verses, we see that an earthquake happens where one-tenth of the city falls, and we're told that 7,000 men are slain. You may remember earlier in this series, we discussed symbolism in general and the fact that there were several earthquakes in the book of Revelation. Unfortunately, our generation is no stranger to earth-shattering events, nor are we surprised at the large number of lives lost in major earthquakes. But I have to ask, can a literal earthquake with 7,000 people being killed really answer to the magnitude worthy of this book? Please don't get me wrong, I'm not downplaying the tragedy of such a literal event, but how do you tie in a literal earthquake with the Antichrist? or his rise to power, his beastly and cruel reign, and his ultimate overthrow by Yeshua, the Messiah's kingdom? You really can't. The answer is history. History rises to the magnitude that this book suggests, and I trust you'll agree with me by the time we finish today. It's Mr. Barnes who will again begin the interpretation of these passages. When he tells us, in the suddenness of the attack made on the existing state of things, in the commotions which were produced, in the overthrow of so many governments, there was a striking resemblance to the convulsions caused by an earthquake. So Dr. Lingard speaks of the Reformation when he said, quote, that religious revolution which astonished and convulsed the nations of Europe. Nothing would better represent the convulsions caused in Germany, Switzerland, Prussia, Saxony, Sweden, Denmark, and England by the Reformation than an earthquake. You know, it's really important to understand that we're being told that this earthquake happens at the same hour as the witness's resurrection. Those are two little words and they make a big distinction. This is actually where I struggled with chapter 11. This is where I jumped track, so to speak, with others who hold this historicist view. Some see this, this earthquake as the French Revolution. But this small fact, this small detail that it happens at the same hour that the witnesses are resurrected is important. Now we just saw that October the 31st, 1517, the date that Martin Luther nailed his 95 Thesis to the door of a Wittenberg church, officially beginning the Reformation, well, that's several hundred years before the French Revolution, which occurs in 1789. Besides that, after the seventh trumpet sounds, there's another earthquake, which, as I told you just moments ago, will herald the first four bowls, and they're the Napoleonic Wars. So I believe that earthquake to be better viewed as the French Revolution. So I'm going to make the assertion that this earthquake is happening at the same time as the Reformation, and I'll go further to say that the earthquake is the Reformation. And Mr. Wiley is going to tell us that the, wet, the resurrection of the witnesses, like that of their Lord, was accompanied by an earthquake. The earthquake was connected with and sprung out of the resurrection and may therefore be viewed as symbolizing a revolution mainly of a moral or a religious character. Now that certainly is one way of describing the Reformation. However, the French Revolution could not be characterized that way at all. In fact, quite the opposite. He says, in the earthquake, the tenth part of the city fell to explain this, we have only to bear in mind that the city was constituted of the ten Roman kingdoms of Europe, thus confederated under the papacy. 
He asks, which of these 10 kingdoms was it that fell at the Reformation as a popish country? He says the answer is Britain. The fall of this 10th part or tithe of this city was the first fruits, he says, as it were, of that great harvest of destruction awaiting the papacy. It's really important what Mr. Wiley has just disclosed. We've spoken of the great city as the city of Rome, but we cannot lose sight that we're really looking at Babylon, this spiritual city, where the kingdom of darkness reigns and the citizens of that kingdom have their citizenship. Now, in contrast, we as believers in Messiah live in the spiritual city of New Jerusalem, the heavenly city. And we're told often in the New Testament that our citizenship is not on this earth, but in the heavenly city, Jerusalem, coming down out of the heavens. I think it's in this way that Mr. Wiley means to suggest that the entire Holy Roman Empire is the city in question, and that one-tenth of the Holy Roman Empire is what falls. This is probably the first time you've heard me use that phrase, Holy Roman Empire. That's because I've been holding it close to my chest, and we're going to talk about it more, yes, in chapter 13. But suffice it to say, for now, it has fluid boundaries. And that quote-unquote image of the Roman Empire was much later dubbed the Holy Roman Empire, and not by its enemies, but by its faithful. I happen to think that that name more than does justice to the blatant truths of its origins. Now, history does record the Ten Kingdoms that were formed after the fall of the Western Roman Empire in 476 AD. And we know this because it was formed by those nations which flooded into that area via the trumpet judgments. And we can know without a doubt today the connections between those early kingdoms that formed the Holy Roman Empire and today's European nations. The Alemanni became Germany. The Franks, France. Swavi, Portugal. The Vandals settled portions of Poland and Romania. The Burgundians, Switzerland. The Visigoths, or Western Goths, settled Spain. The Ostrogoths went into Italy, France, and Germany in the east. The Huns became Hungary. The Lombards settled Italy. And the Saxons founded England. And most of us remember that from our high school history. We are going to focus on England, settled by the Saxons, who became one of those ten kingdoms that helped to form the Holy Roman Empire. And it was, in fact, one of the first to fall away. And when England fell away from Babylon, from the Holy Roman Empire, Babylon was reduced by one-tenth. If nothing else, you have to admit that this is sheer poetry, in the sense of timing and impression, it's like watching a dance as this history unfolds. And next, Mr. Elliot asks us, and is it true that history records the fact of the falling away of one of the original 10 kingdoms of papal Christendom from the Roman church overthrown by Protestantism? He says, surely it points to England, to England, one of the most notable of those 10 parts of the great apostate city. The story of this revolution, he says, may be told in a few words. And I'm going to take just a few moments and tell you that quick history, and I don't even feel bad about it. I believe I told you from the very start that this is as much a history lesson as it is a biblical lesson. After all, the historicist view sees this as his story. So Mr. Elliot would tell us that the Lutherans visited the shores of England and when their teaching was rekindled with the teaching of the Lollards, those street preachers, and the Wycliffeites, it already had begun to change men's minds. He tells us that political changes preceded the spiritual movement in England. And when the Reformation first began, Henry VIII was king of England. Now he was staunchly Catholic and had even come forward as the champion of the papacy to dispute Martin Luther. And so the Pope honored Henry with the title Defender of the Faith. But in 1534, King Henry broke away from the Roman Catholic faith and created the Protestant Church of England, otherwise known as the Anglican Church. He made Protestantism 
the official religion of England, and he made himself, as well as all future English monarchs, the head of the church, pretty much booting the papacy out on its heels. Now, unfortunately, his break from the church wasn't because he had become Protestant in his beliefs, but because the Pope refused to grant him a divorce from his wife, Catherine. Henry, sadly, continued practicing many Catholic beliefs, actually bringing them into the Church of England. And between his errors, the official religion would volley back and forth between Protestantism and Catholicism for many years. But Elizabeth I, who took the throne after the death of Mary in 1558, being a Protestant, restored the Church of England, and it has remained such ever since. So, okay, we see the big picture, but we still have to connect these symbols to the history in order to purport this view, right? Well, the next thing John tells us is that slain of men were 7,000. And again, let's look at those Greek words behind the English ones to get some more definition. Slain is apoktino, to destroy, nothing earth shattering there. But this next little word of, very important, we see that it's onama in the Greek, and it's translated as of, even though the definition is name or names. And that's gonna become very important in just a moment as we will see. The next words are fairly straightforward. Anthropoid is man, hepta is seven, and chileus or chiliads, is thousands. And we'll look at that word a little closer as well. So this would be really a good time for a word pun to ask what's in a name. And Christine Miller of the Revelation of Jesus Christ revealed is all but happy to try to answer that for us. She says the Greek phrase, according to Young's literal translation, is actually and killed in the earthquake were names of men, several thousands. The Greek word for names is in the Greek text, but it's just skipped over and not translated into the English. She says presumably because it made more sense for men to be slain than for the names of men to be slain. Well, this small phrase makes a huge difference. It really renders the phrase, again, slain in the earthquake were the names of men, seven thousands. She says, wait, there's more. A second translation issue is present. The number 7,000 is in Greek, seven chiliads, and that would be this word. So now that we have a slightly different view of this verse, principally that names seem to be what is slain, we once again look to Mr. Eliot and to history for the answers. He says, another result of the earthquake is given. There were slain 7,000s or chiliads names of men. Observe that it's not the numeral adjective that is here used, but the substantive chiliads. He says the term is originally Jewish, denoting a subdivision of a tribe. And then he quotes the Exodus portion that says, Moses chose able men, rulers of thousands. It's this ruler of thousands, if we were to look into the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament, where we would see the word chiliads. Henceforth, the chiliad being about 1 50th of a tribe became noted as a subdivision in Israel. To these chiliads, land was allotted and each became a district, like the hundred, he says, in an English county, and gave a name or distinctive title to its chief ruler. Let's not miss this connection. We've already seen that England was the first of the 10 kingdoms to fall away from the Holy Roman Empire. So now we're just looking to see if there's any subsequent interruption in any divisions or subdivisions in the Holy Roman Empire. To which Mr. Eliot says, we have only to turn to history again and to see whether any subdivisions of Western Christendom were in fact separated from papal Rome and so might be considered politically destroyed at the time papal England fell and by the same agency vis-a-vis -vis that of Protestant principles. What then do we find? 
Well, we read that during the reign of Elizabeth, the seven united Dutch provinces were emancipated from the Spanish yoke. And at the same time, the papal rule and religion were destroyed in them. He says the seven Chiliads of the papal city were overthrown and out of their ruins arose the Protestant Republic of Holland. While this certainly seems to be a connection between England and these seven Chiliads or subdivisions, let's look at the map to the right. That brown area, that is the Protestant Republic of Holland and two things that are important there. Not only is it Protestant because it's going to pull away from the Holy Roman Empire, but this is the first republic since the early, early days of the Roman Republic. Many people, including myself, thought that the United States was the first republic since then, but actually Protestant uh, Holland became the first republic, and that's more of just some trivia for us history buffs. And for a little context, this yellow area is the Holy Roman Empire as of 1648 AD. Now, as I've said before, it had very fluid boundaries and it's going to ebb and flow throughout the centuries. This small area is the Protestant Republic of Holland. Again, as we have seen, it has a great location there on the east, on the uh, sea. And what you can't see just to the upper left corner off this map is England. So that's helpful to those of us who are a little more geographically challenged, myself being, of course, the, the num number one person. But again, this is huge that they even can pull away from this large vortex that sucks everything into it. We really just need a little more history. And so Mr. Elliot is going to help us with that. He tells us that the first constitution of these as provinces was at the time Roman Gaul was conquered by the Franks. The Netherlands, including French and Dutch Flanders, formed part of the Frankish Empire. But they were divided into 17 provinces at first, each being a territorial domain assigned to some chieftain, much like the territorial Chiliads assigned to Israel on their settlement in Canaan. Thus the earthquake under which England, the 10th kingdom of the Popeton, had just fallen off, began to threaten its supremacy in these lesser districts as well. And the union of the seven united provinces in 1579 was formed by deputies of Holland, Zeeland, Utrecht, Friesland, Groenigen, Oversel, and Guelderlin. Now, in the course of the 700 years between Charlemagne and Charles V, these are both Roman, Holy Roman emperors. And by the way, we'll discuss how Charlemagne became the first emperor of the Holy Roman Empire a little bit later. But these provinces passed down from Charles V then to Philip II of Spain. And into the provinces, Protestant doctrines found their way and they were martyred to the tune of 100,000 um, who sealed the truth of what they were preaching with their blood. He goes on to say that it was only the arm of power and dread of the Spanish Inquisition well underway at this point that long prevented an open outbreak in these provinces. But under Philip, uh, political oppression was added to the religious oppression, and so finally in 1569, a war broke out. Now, it would take the 37 years war before Spain and the papacy would realize the impossibility of recovering these seven provinces. And Mr. Elliot says, such were the two principal and permanent changes that rose out of the earthquake attendant on the Reformation. Well, the only thing left really for us to do is to connect Holland's breaking away from the Holy Roman Empire with England's falling away. And the Treaty of Nonsuch does just that for us. We see it was signed on the 10th of August, 1585, by Elizabeth I of England and the Dutch rebels fighting against the Spanish rule. It was the first international treaty signed by what would become the Dutch Republic and it was signed at Nonsuch Palace in England, hence its name. 
Notice the date. It has only been six years since the seven Dutch provinces formed and rebelled against Spain when England signed this treaty. And Philip II of Spain viewed the treaty as a declaration of war against him by Elizabeth I. So he started the Anglo-Spanish War. Just three years later, he launches the Spanish Armada, attempting to invade and conquer England. Now, surely the resources that he spent on the Armada undoubtedly diverted significant resources from fighting the Dutch Revolt, which aided, I'm sure, their success. The Treaty of Nonsuch also signaled that England had turned the United Provinces into a protectorate of England. So clearly we see a very solid connection between this 10th part of the city falling away, that is England, and the seven Chiliads or districts or provinces also being destroyed in this earthquake of the Reformation. Now let's get to our final verses and I want to talk about this war on the witnesses. This beast waging war is just the beginning. His campaign against the witnesses is just the beginning. In those early years before the Reformation, it had been estimated that no fewer than 50 millions of persons had been put to death on account of religion. We also saw that the greater part had been cut off during the last half of this beast's existence. But 50 million persons in the space of 600 years is no less impressive. It gives a rate of upwards of 80,000 every year. Now this hardly believable history prompted James Wiley to write, when we think that 80,000 human beings has she sacrificed 600 times told, we have no words to express our astonishment and horror at her guilt. He says, what a Holocaust, 50 millions of lives. How fearful a meaning does this fact impart to the words of John. I saw the woman drunken with blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus and in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. You know, if we try to make this city, the great city, Rome or Jerusalem, it doesn't make sense. There's no way that the blood of all who have been slain upon the earth fits inside of those cities. It wasn't done inside of all of those cities. But if we look symbolically, and see this as Babylon, spiritual Babylon, the kingdom of darkness. This makes perfect sense. These were indeed bloody years, but as I said, they were only the beginning. For just a short seven years after the Reformation in 1524 to 1525, the German peasant wars between the Protestants and the Catholics left between 100,000 to 200,000 dead. Next came the French wars of religion, from 1562 to 1598, between the Protestants and Catholics, Catholics with an estimated 2 million to 4 million dead. And then the Eighty Years' War, from 1568 to 1648, leaving 600 to 700,000 dead between the Protestants and Catholics. Next, the Thirty Years' War, from 1618 to 1648 with an astounding 4 million to 12 million dead. This war was between the Protestants and the Catholics. And last but certainly not least, the War of the Three Kingdoms from 1639 to 1651, with 315,000 to 868,000 left dead, with 616,000 of those alone in Ireland. Again, it's in this way that we make the distinction between the historical persecution and the campaign waged by the beast against these two witnesses. When we zero in on the papal beast of this time period, he truly conquered those early witnesses, destroying their testimony, silencing their prophecy. And he did so for exactly three and one half years between the Fifth Lateran Council of May 5th, 1514, and the official start of the Reformation on October the 31st, 1517. The early witnesses simply passed on the torch to the reformers, and many of them met with the same fate. And that's what we're looking at here.
In our final verse today, Jesus tells John the second woe is past. And he actually warns John in verse 14 that the third woe is coming quickly. And while we remember that things have been bad and we think, how could it get worse? We have to understand that this trumpet brings all seven bowls full of the wrath of God and they're aimed directly at the reincarnated beast. This woe is headed for the Antichrist and his kingdom. He's about to reap what he's been sowing. Well, this concludes part 15, Can I Get a Witness? Next time on the Book of Revelation Historicist View, part 16, The Last Trump, otherwise entitled The Seventh Trumpet Sounds. We're going to be taking a small detour and cover some important foundation for chapter 16 where the bold judgments are found. Because historically speaking, there's been a lot more going on than just the Reformation. There's actually been a threefold phenomenon in play that sets the stage for the first four bold judgments. The Renaissance, the Reformation, and the Age of Reason. These three epochs overlaid upon each other drastically changes the worldview of believers and non-believers alike. The events that unfold beginning with the first bold judgment will set off a chain reaction that spirals through and propels the world into the 20th century. But before we can even get to that first bowl being poured out, we're going to have to cover more parenthetical chapters, the woman and the dragon and the two beasts. So until then, I pray that you stay well. I hope you keep studying and I bid you shalom. And I'll see you next time on part 16, The Last Trump. This is Lebanon Springs House. Shalom. <laughs>